Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ. And Kitty. And Kitty. <laughs> I wonder oh, what the pause of, is for. Cup of coffee. Have another coffee. Have another coffee. Where's <laughs> Would my, you have another? Where's my Starbucks? <laughs> Hope you had a wonderful, blessed weekend. We did. We got to take our RV out and, and take a couple days and rest. It was very nice, and Deacon did very well, for those of you who wonder. <laughs> <laughs> very peaceful. When you're such a loving family, you don't mind close quarters. <laughs> That's and, right. Uh, and it was just a lovely time and we got to, to minister to, to uh, somebody and it was really something and, and so here we are it's Monday morning and we greet you in the name of the Lord and uh, direct your attention now to Exodus chapter 30 and uh, we're continuing in our daily Bible study going through the Bible chapter by chapter, doing expositional study as opposed to topical study. Topical study has its place, but when you do expositional, you just take the Bible as it comes and you allow the Word of God to speak to you uh, as opposed to uh, filtering and gathering scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and uh, crafting uh, something on a particular subject. And there are messages and themes uh, that are uh, much broader than one or two verses. We have to remind ourselves that the chapter breaks and the verse breaks are not um, part of the canon. They're not part of the infallibility of the Word of God. And uh, occasionally I, I do a lot of study and um Bible numbers and so on and so forth and occasionally you'll see people that will make uh, uh, observations about for instance the middle uh, verse of the Bible or chapters <laughs> uh, that relate to certain things but uh, again uh, the chapter breaks and the verse breaks are a uh, Victorian invention. They were not, they didn't come till much, much later, and we need to be reminded of that. And so if you didn't have the chapter in verse, you would have to read uh, whole passages without uh, taking it as an artificial stopping point. There are many places where you, if you just keep reading, many, many chapters start out with uh, the words, therefore, in other words, there, was, there were thoughts that were established, uh, groundwork that was laid, and we need to have the whole message. Somebody said once, you, you need to find out what it's there for. <laughs> <laughs> and, and why would that be important? Because the Lord tells me all the time, things are the way they are because of what you've been doing. If you want something different, you need to do something different. And part of that, by doing expositional study, now listen to me. By doing expositional study, I'm seeing to it, we are seeing to it, that you get your whole Bible back. <laughs> and because it's the whole counsel of the Word of God. Yeah. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, it, and it's not any particular scripture. It's not the popular scriptures of the day or the popular verses in, in your particular corner of the Christian world. And so if uh, we're not uh, in inculcating, indoctrinating ourselves with the whole counsel of God, uh, then uh, we have an anemic uh, body of Scripture, and then we have an anemic Christian experience. And so we just have to use our just common understanding. It's like uh, when I was... Uh, a young baby pastor. I came out of uh, Pentecostal charismatic traditions, and and we called ourselves full gospel. And then uh, the more I learned uh, in the things of God, I began to run into things that were true that were not uh, uh, expressed in the parameters of the the general doctrinal positions of tongue-talking Christians. And I heard the Lord say one time, it ain't full till it's full. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because there are things that charismatic Pentecostal people um, uh, 
auto automatically reject just like people that believe in the cessation they don't think gifts of the spirit are for today prophecies for today healing is for today and we look at them and we yes they don't understand <laughs> the deep things of god well give me uh, about two minutes with any tongue-talking christian and i can completely alienate him and he'll be pointing his finger at me calling me a heretic and all i'm doing is just simply, simply finding veracities in the scripture that fall outside the envelope of Pentecostal charismatic propriety, renewalist propriety. And uh, what is renewalist? Renewalist includes Pentecostals, charismatics, independent denominational, what we call charismatic Catholics, the Pew Research Foundation groups them all under the term renewalist, because there are people that believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the activity of the Holy Spirit in their lives and through their lives. So it's a useful term I, I like to propagate in this, in my teaching so that uh, it, it helps us have a conversation. Uh, so we're going now to Exodus chapter 30 in our study, and we're going to begin... Levy Devi, mm -hmm. that's her ecclesiastical uh, <laughs> title. Uh, <laughs> Terms of endearment. If you would precious. read. Precious. <laughs> you didn't know I called them precious, did you? <laughs> if you would read verses 1 through 6. <laughs> now all of your friends will be calling you precious. 1 through 6, chapter 30. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of shit and wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof, round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a, gold, a crown of gold round about. And two gold rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof. Upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it, and thou shalt be, they shall be for a place for the staves to bear withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. Okay. Now, when we approach these verses, you know, it isn't enough like, oh, I want to impress you with my insight into these verses that you never thought about before. No, I want to give you, I want to give you the insight. Uh, anytime you read these verses, you want to ask yourself two questions. Uh, what does this tell me about who Jesus is to me? And what does this tell me about who I am to Jesus? Uh, because all of these types and shadows, remember Paul said that those things that are recorded for us in the Old Covenant, what we call the Old Testament, happened to, to those people in that time as examples to us on whom the ends of the age have come. He, he taught plainly in his teaching that, that they were the shadow. God's dealings with them was the shadow. We are the substance. So again, what does this tell me about who Jesus is to me? And what does it tell me about who I am to Jesus or who I am in Christ? And it will, it will help you gain understanding and i just pray god gives you that spirit of Amen. revelation and understanding i want this i want to the spirit of revelation uh when you have that then you're able to take the logos of god which is the in, the infallible scripture printed on rice paper and bonded leather and uh and hatch a rhema it's Amen. taking the objective word of god the infallible objective word of god and bringing it into subjective application in a dynamic way that changes your life. Remember the Word of God is a two-edged sword. It's the Logos, the objective Word of God, and the Rhema, the subjective Word of God. That's what Peter referred to when he said, uh, he said, you need to be established in the present truth. That's the revelatory truth, uh, the testamental truth of God, where it says in Revelation 19.10, the uh, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Um, the prophetic. Remember, always remember that the tabernacle that we're studying, the very center of this tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant that was called the Ark, also the Ark of the Testimony because the prophecies that God gave Moses were put in it. And so the prophetic 
Uh, it's amazing. First Thessalonians 5, 7, I believe it is, says, despise not prophesying. Even in the first century, uh, the prophetic was held suspect. Uh, uh, but always remember that, that God is a speaking God, and one means by which he speaks to us, and a means by which he mentors us to hear his voice is through the prophetic. And at the at the heart of this, what they put in the Ark of the Covenant is like whenever we transcribe our prophecies uh, in a in a subjective way uh, that you know the you, the prophetic words over your life that have been that have been vetted and confirmed that they need to be s- central to not just off of some dusty little place you pull them down once in a while they need to be central and core to your vision and God's purpose in your life so. In this passage, Exodus 31 through 6, God instructs Moses regarding what is known as the altar of incense. Now, remember that there are three compartments in the tabernacle. Now, what is the tabernacle? It was the elaborate tent that God instructed Moses to build to facilitate Israel's worship of Jehovah. These three compartments were the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. And throughout this tabernacle were various artifacts used in sacrifices and priestly activities. Again, uh, where the Bible talks about outer darkness, study it out. You do enough research, you'll find out that it was referring to the light or the illumination in each of these three compartments. There's the outer court, inner court, holy of holies. The outer court was open air and it was illuminated by the light of the sun. The inner court uh, was part of the covered part, part of the tabernacle and it was illuminated by the golden lampstand, which had seven branches, speaks of the seven churches, the seven spirits of God and are referred to throughout prophecy. Um, And then there was the Holy of Holies, which was completely enclosed in darkness, but yet it was totally lit up because of the Shekinah glory of God that rested between the cherubim, not on the seat of judgment, but on the seat of mercy, what was known as the mercy seat. Isn't that wonderful? That even in the old covenant, the heart of worship was a mercy seat. Seat. I think we, we our, our religious culture, sometimes we need to be reminded of that. And, oh, we know that, Brother Walden, do we? Then how come, whenever somebody starts uh, revelating uh, or preaching some deep message about the move of God and who God is and the revival that's coming, and they always uh, burp up at one point, It's going to be the days of Ananias and Sapphira. Why? Because they have a judgment seat, not a mercy seat. Ouch. They're more interested in stepping on toes than they are washing feet. Uh, Everybody, you know, that the people see the Ananias and Sapphira incident where they went in and were struck dead before Peter because they lied to the Holy Ghost. They take that as the high watermark of the dealings of God. So they, and they, how many times I've heard it said by by anointed preachers using the anointing of God to to disseminate a skewed message, and it will be as the days of Ananias and Sapphira. But nobody notice nobody's volunteering to be Ananias and Sapphira. Always applies to somebody else. <laughs> so so there's an outer court. An inner court and a holy of holies. So my question to you is, are you an outer court Christian? Or are you an inner court Christian? Or are you a holy of holies Christian? Three different things. Uh, And uh, the inner court contained three pieces of furniture or artifacts. Two of them we've already talked about. The table of showbread, the golden lampstand, and now we come... It's interesting... Later on, we come to the altar of incense. It's the last one addressed. We have the brazen altar in the outer court, Mm -hmm. 
the table of showbread, which speaks to us as Jesus is our bread of life. It speaks to us of healing. Uh, there's the golden lampstand, which speaks to us of the seven spirits of God, the illumination of God's wisdom in our in our lives. And now we come to this that represent the altar of incense that speaks to us of intercession and and prayer. Um, and this altar of incense stood in the middle, in between the golden lampstand and the table of of showbread. Now, now, stop and think about this. The outer court is the 30-fold realm. Jesus talked about this. We're, let's compare the tabernacle to the parable of the sower. There's the, the good ground, the seed that falls on good ground. He said the ground was the heart of man, the seed was the word of God, and the good ground uh, produces some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. Some outer court Christians, some inner court Christians, some holy of holies Christians. Now, which, which are you? It's all good ground. Some people are out there, they spend their lives, and the majority of Christianity it, it finds its identity in what the outer court represents, because the brazen altar speaks of where we come into the gate, and Jesus said he was the door, we come into the entrance, and the first thing we see is the brazen altar where we get our sins dealt with. And most people, most Christians throughout uh, 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 modern history have never gone beyond that. They're born again. You know, God bless Billy Graham. But Billy Graham's message is an outer court message because it never goes beyond the the brazen altar. Uh, how many t- how many times have those of you that have, have come up generationally in the Baptist church and for the most part, uh, traditionally speaking, it may have changed some, but you go into a church that does not believe in in what we tend to call the deeper things of God, that that statement by, might be a little arrogant, but uh, you uh, you hear the same message over and over: salvation, 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 and an altar call being given uh, to a church full of people, and everybody's bo- born again. We wondered nobody's coming to the altar. Well, they're all born again. Hello, and. Uh, the so the brazen altar is an is the thirty fold realm, but then there's the sixty fold realm where there's the lampstand and the revelation from God, the table of showbread. We believe in healing and the altar of incense. We believe in inter, intercession. We need to be praying. Yes, we need to be doing all those things. But don't forget, there's the inmost court where the shekinah of God is, and without the shekinah of God. We have a vacated tabernacle that is just a, uh, an empty religious construct, mm. and so we don't want to we don't want to get stuck in our thinking in the thirty fold realm or the sixty fold realm. That's the part realm, uh, but we want to move on into the inner the inner court, into the inmost court. Uh, we read the the verses last week about mm-hmm. Jesus consecrated that. Je- by a new and living way that Jesus consecrated for us. It's his consecration producing access uh, into the inmost place of God's Shekinah presence. That scripture, honey, I'm thinking about um, about knowing him and uh, pressing in. For them we, oh, now we know in part, we see in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, and that which is in part shall be done away, mm. that what if that was the hundredfold? When well, you see good. him, because oh, you've always good. taught us that if you see him, you're going to be like him, <laughs> and that's your hundredfold return right wow. there. That's where, and that's where he says, where there shall be tongues, they shall cease. Uh-huh. Where there's just... Prophecies you know, will fail. Yeah, we don't need to prophesy. Come on, let's have that. You know, the prophets, when they were in the... when they. When they were in uh, 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 the throne room, they were not. They were not speaking. They were listening. There was no place for mm-hmm. prophecy when John the Revelator was before the throne. There was no place for prophecy when God reached down and picked up Ezekiel by a lock of his hair and held him up over the plain of Chebar and showed him the glory of God <laughs> on the plain. There was no place for for prophecy when I, Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord and his train filled the temple. What an awesome revelation that is, Kitty. Thank you, God. That we always think about is where there be prophecies, they will cease. Where there's tongues, they shall they shall cease. We mm-hmm. hear in part, we know in part. Yes, the thirty, sixty fold realm. But one day we're going to move into the hundred fold realm, where we're going to be doing all the listening, mm-hmm. 
<laughs> and he's going to be doing all the talking, and it's going to be a direct connection, what one writer called direct connection with the divine. Now, to me, that was a perfect demonstration. It wow. came by surprise, but it was what you talked about a few minutes That's ago. That's a rama. You hatched a rama, I honey. I hatched a rama sitting here on the couch. <laughs> it's a boy. <laughs> And his name is Glory Jesus. Glory to God. Uh, and his uh, name is Jesus. That's awesome. So the, the altar of incense, it stands directly, it's in the middle between the table of showbread and the golden lampstand, directly in front of the entrance to the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat there on. And uh, notice he said, and there I will meet you. See, always, every time he talk, he would talk about the mercy seat that is over the testimony, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I keep coming back to the emphasis on the prophetic there in verse uh, 6. Um, we tend to be in a religious culture that emphasizes uh, uh, only one of the fivefold ministries, which is the ministry of the pastor. But if you go from Genesis to Revelation you will see the ministry of the prophetic mentioned with the exception of Acts where the prophetic takes a back seat uh, to, th to the apostolic, which uh, f 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 28 says, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. Some people call it a fourfold ministry. They say it's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And, uh, and that is not to, to denigrate or minimize uh, the idea of pastors, but just simply to say, look, it's the five-fold ministry. And if we are weighted more in the emphasis of one particular ministry and we're not experiencing um, the closure of the gap between God's promise and our experience, then things are the way they are because of what we've been doing. If we want something different, we need to do something different. And that is not to to uh, uh, marginalize the pastor. We need the pastor, but pastor, you cannot do it all. Right. You, somehow, some way, you have to begin to have a paradigm that includes the apostolic, that includes uh, the prophetic, that includes. You know, it's fun that it's the fivefold ministry, and five is the number of grace. And honest to goodness, from experience, we can tell you the pastor doesn't have it all. Neither does the prophet have it all. Neither does the evangelist have it all. There's a grace to work and acknowledge. Uh, you know, I don't frustrate the grace of God, the scripture says, wow. because you learn where your grace is. And you don't have, I don't have grace to be an evangelist right now. It's not my grace. So let's give grace and let's, let's share. Let each person have its part. And there's a beautiful fluency, a flow of the spirit that now way. someone might think well yes you're, you're just advocating for your ministry no oh, you no. need to understand <laughs> i've been a pastor my whole life and i have the heart of an evangelist <laughs> and kitty has been a pastor for oh, years yeah. that's where i come from that's my dna and mm -hmm. and for over 20 years uh uh 15 years as a full-time pastor five years overseeing uh 900 churches and the ministers associated with them as a, as a denominational overseer, working with, with pastors. I understand the heart of a pastor. I know why pastors either don't know how or they are unwilling to, to open up, to include the full bandwidth of the five-fold ministry because of insecurity, because they've been burned, because they've been disappointed. Sure. And quite frankly, in the natural uh, I couldn't blame a pastor for having a anti-prophetic uh, uh, attitude. Have you seen most of the prophets out there? They're prophesying doom and gloom. They're not edifying, encouraging the people. They're trying to be like uh, James and John that wanted to call down fire from heaven. They prophesy out of an old covenant paradigm rather than a new covenant paradigm. But we have to begin to allow them to come up into being policy-making members of the leadership of the body of Christ because uh, an immature prophet sometimes is better than no prophet at all. And so somebody really needs to 
needs to hear that. And how will they ever mature? The scripture says only through reason of use we have our senses exercised to discern both good and evil. How are they ever going to grow up? Even in our prophetic schools, we, we, the prophetic schools today are more about what you can't do than what you can do. And they just have all this litmus test because their priority is more preserving the credibility of the school and the ministry than it is activating people into the call of God. We do a little bit differently in our school. Uh, we want to activate you. We've got more faith for you than you have for yourself. Yeah. And we'll just drag you kicking and screaming and, and, and hurl you over the precipice of God's purpose like uh, the old Ozark daddy used to throw his kids out into the swimming hole, you know. And he's not going to let you drown. <laughs> he's going to want you to see you can swim. Hello. <laughs> So, uh, the altar of incense was made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Now, acacia is the same wood that the crown of thorns was made of that was beat down upon Jesus' head. And it was our sins that put that there. And so, acacia speaks to us of imperfect humanity. Sinful humanity redeemed by the blood of Christ, overlaid with gold, which is gold speaks to us of God's uh, nature. Now notice that this is the second of two altars. Yeah. And you see two altars. There's the altar in the outer court, the brazen altar. It's acacia wood overlaid with brass. When you came in the entrance of the outer court, remember Jesus is the door, the first thing you saw was the brazen altar. Jesus said, I am the door. No man comes to Father but by me. You go through that door. The first thing we do is get saved. Give your life to Jesus. Because the first altar deals with sin. The second altar is what brings you into deep relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The first altar establishes your fellowship with God. The second altar establishes your relationship with God. He becomes your Papa. He becomes your Savior at the first altar. He becomes your Lord at the second altar. And again, it's the same old thing. People that don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they get saved and they quote the scriptures out of John. Uh, he'll baptize you. I baptize you with water. And you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. And when you get saved, you get the baptism in water and the Holy Ghost and fire all rolled into one. No, you don't. And we've done the same thing with Romans chapter 10. We accept Jesus as, as Lord and Savior, but I don't think it's something that happens all, all in one fell stroke. Oh, no. We're always wanting to include ourselves. In, okay, okay, we got it all now. Because oh. <laughs> we're too insecure to admit the fact we don't have it all. And until there is no gap between God's promise and our experience, mm. guess what? We don't have it all. Amen. Things are the way they are because of what we're doing, what we're believing. And if, and if uh, we are experiencing a gap between God's promise and our experience, then we don't, there's something missing. There's something, and we need to learn to be willing uh, to live with those questions and allow them to lead us inexorably to the full experience and substance of all that God has done for us. So he is established in these two altars. When we come to the first altar and our fellowship with God is, is established and uh, we uh, receive forgiveness of sins. He becomes our savior. But then when we find the second altar, then he becomes our father. Mm -hmm. Then he becomes our Lord and he gets our Lord and our master, the, the, the potentate of our, mm -hmm. of our heart. What's that scripture? I, I don't know if I could quote it, uh, but there's some really eloquent titles that Paul accorded, uh, to Jesus. And I can't quote him right now, but, uh, uh, so there are two altars, and both of these altars also speak to us of prayer, because the brazen altar represents repentance to deal with sin to establish fellowship with God. The altar of incense represented consecration leading to relationship and entering into the Shekinah light of God that was the only illumination in the holy place. And, and let me say something. See, we believe in, uh, those of us that are evangelical, we believe in the new birth experience. But there are 
But there are three compartments in the tabernacle. The outer court represents the new birth. The inner court represents the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy of Holies represents the baptism of fire. Which, whatever that is, it's a personal experience we haven't received yet. Now, the holiness movement in the late 1800s that gave birth to the Azusa Street outpouring and what became the renewalist demographic in uh, evangelical Christianity, uh, they, the holiness movement believed in what they called the second definite work of grace because they didn't believe in tongues. Mm -hmm. But what they did believe is you could get uh, uh, born again but then you became sanctified. And uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance uh, at one time believed that, whether they believe that now, they, I, I, they believe it on paper, uh, whether that's their practice or not. The Church of the Nazarene, whether they believe that now, they believed it in, year, in years past. And uh, if you want to read a wonderful book, that will just, I don't agree with the man's theology, but I so appreciate the character of this testimony where John Wesley, he believed that original sin had been expunged from his life by a second definite work of grace. He got born again, forgiven, and then original sin was expunged from his life, and he testified of it in a book called A Plain Account of Christian Perfection. If you Google it, you can find a free PDF for it. And but you can get it in any any bookstore any, anywhere where Christian books are sold, and uh, the whole book is it doesn't it, it it focuses inward. It's all about the inward life in Christ, and I I love what he said. He said I'm for, forgiven, and I'm clean, but I'm not perfect. Mm. And he was it doesn't say he was free from mistakes, but he believed he was free from sin. And uh, I've seen some people. I've, I've known a handful of people in my lifetime, while, while doctrinally, I don't know that I agree with that, but yet I've seen some people whose lives, if I was going to just judge by their lives, I would say uh, they, they were a testimony to that experience. And I grew up around a whole generation of people in backwoods Pentecost who weren't just putting it on on the outside. Today you see the primitive Pentecostals Unfortunately, so many of them, uh, it's all an outward show, and they dress in an odd and peculiar way. They're trying to be peculiar. They believe it's important to be peculiar for Jesus, and they're doing their best to make sure everybody sees it. And uh, But I grew up um, in the midst of that generation from a simpler time. And I remember sitting uh, in church camps, in open-air church camps with sawdust floors, when they would be preaching in during the day, the ladies were, were sitting on the, the back porch and they were dressed with their buns and their, their peculiar Pentecostal dress, snapping beans, fi fixing a, a dinner for everybody on the grounds and mm -hmm. talking about the Lord and praying with tears running down their face. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it so impressed me. Uh, their, their piety and their, the quality of their relationship with God. I was in awe uh, of it. But the point being is there's three components of the tabernacle and there's three components uh, of uh, uh, spiritual experience. There's the new birth, there's the, that, that saves your spirit, there's the, you become spiritually reborn. There's the baptism in the Holy Ghost that works upon the soul. Don't have time to get into a long discussion of that. You can find a teaching on that in, on our YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, it, the baptism in the Holy Ghost um, has an impact upon your speech. And the script, James said that your tongue is the most unruly thing in God's creation. So it's the furthest thing from God. And when it's immersed, uh, then you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. What's left after you're, you're spiritually reborn by salvation, your soul and mind are renewed by the baptism in the Holy Ghost, what's left is your physical body. I believe the what we call the rapture, some people call it the redemption of the purchased possession, the adjudication of the saints, putting on body felt salvation. There's a lot of words for it. Uh, but but whatever the rapture is, it's, it's alluded to even in the three compartments of 
uh, the tabernacle. There's something we don't have yet, and I think it's called the baptism of fire. And if you want to know what it looked like, I think Jesus modeled it on the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's interesting, there's three feasts, Passover, Jesus is our salvation, Pentecost, Jesus is our baptizer of the Holy Ghost, and then tabernacles. And when Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, Peter wanted to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. He wanted to build tabernacles. So so speaks to me. Uh, but it said he didn't know what he was talking about because the tabernacle of God is among men. Jesus was going to build a tabernacle, but it wasn't a building or an te- outward temple. He was building himself into us. <laughs> so the acacia... Uh, represents humanity. And notice that this this altar does not represent the ministry of angels or the relationship of angels. You know, angels are as curious about uh, your interaction with God as we are about their interaction with God. You know, (laughs) we want to see what's at the top of Jacob's ladder and they want to see what's at the bottom. (laughs) Uh, Such things, the scripture says, that angels desire to inquire to look into they just want to understand your connection with god is one of the deepest mysteries they're aware they of don't understand the blood. and they just want to sit around i can just see them sitting around uh with their arms folded stroking their chins just looking at you wow mm-hmm. would you look at that you see god you see god on that girl you see god on that man they just standing around in your in your living room and they're just looking stroking their chins <laughs> I see God on that. Nice. I wish I understood. I wish I understood how. How's that work? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can help them. Maybe, maybe we'll get. Maybe we can get closer to what we don't understand. Christians don't want to get close to something. Oh, I don't understand that. I don't want to go back to that church. Mm-hmm. I don't want to listen to that guy again. I don't understand that. Angels want to get close to what they don't understand mm-hmm. because they're well. They're more interested in their questions than they are in everybody else's answers. So, preaching. so this altar doesn't represent the ministry of angels or the relationship of angels but the relationship between God and man and notice it says that it was four square here we go again thank you Justin <laughs> thanks Justin on the, on the west coast gave <laughs> us a good cubits, went, had help from the somebody cubits. else a uh, couple uh, of people sent us cubit information Justin uh, went went to goes to Angelus Temple which is where the four square denomination was established and he gave us the four pillars it was sweet and the four square it speaks of four gospels and it also speaks uh, a, God bless Amy Simple McPherson very flamboyant from the 1920s. Uh, one time she, in the 1920s, she rode in to the church down the aisle on a policeman's motorcycle in leathers, my goodness, <laughs> and, and jumped off uh, the, the <clears throat> motorcycle, went up to the pulpit and said, sinners are plunging headlong into hell. <laughs> <laughs> she had their attention. Very flamboyant, but she built... A two million in 1920 dollars built a two million dollar church that still stands today mm-hmm. debt free in the midst yeah. of the depression. A mighty woman of God established the four square denomination, and her four squares were from these verses here in Exodus. And her idea of the four square were the four pillars of of the gospel: salvation, baptism in the Holy Ghost, healing, and the soon return of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I just don't think you can impeach that. It's pretty squared. <laughs> it's it's plumb, level, and square. There you are. <laughs> and now I also want you to notice that it was a cubit wide, a cubit deep, but it was two cubits high. Now what does that mean? It was twice as high as it was wide. Now think about this. This speaks to us about p- priorities of consecration in the kingdom. Before we can go wide in our walk with God, we should go high Amen. in our walk with God. Amen. Before we reach out, we say, oh, it's about souls. No, it's not. Oh, it's about the kids. You know, everybody wants to, the mega churches they were building, they always say, oh, yeah, you get the kids, you get the parents. It's about the kids. No, it's not. Oh, it's about the family. No, it's not. Mm-hmm. The church is built upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. But before we can reach out to others, we need to reach up. 
you cannot allow yourself to become so horizontally focused on others that you lose your vertical relationship to God. I love that. I, I, I've been in the ministry my whole life, and over and over, I, the big, the one of the number one uh, front burner issues for people in ministry is I'm so busy ministering to people, I don't have time to spend with God. Mm-hmm. Because, quite frankly, the average church, we don't pay our preacher to pray. We don't pay our preacher to get close to God. You were supposed to be close to God when we hired you. Now we want you to get out there and mm-hmm. and be the CEO and chief of, uh, operating officer of this not-for-profit corporation mm-hmm. uh, we call the church. Jesus. And I, I remember when we were going through years ago, when I was pastoring in, in uh, Louisiana, we had a church. We went through years of focus on prayer and intercession, and I, I got lost in prayer. I got caught up in the ministry of prayer, and I crossed this threshold. It was like a line of demarcation, and suddenly my anointing, the anointing of God in my life, became more identified with the activity of prayer than it was preaching and doing all the other churchy stuff. And so, you know, being a young pastor, I opened my mouth and I said, I feel more called of God to pray for you than I do to preach to you. And it almost cost me my position as a pastor because all of a sudden the people were insecure because prayer wasn't enough. Consecration to God wasn't wasn't enough. But I want you to notice in these artifacts in the holy place, the one that represents prayer is in the middle. Mm -hmm. The table of showbread the which represents ministry of healing and so forth provision the golden lampstand which represents the light of truth and preaching that's off to the side and if and if our our idea of what the ministry is there for in our life is about oh they're there to teach me well you have a sideline uh, understanding of the purpose of god mm. the most potent thing we th- we we are taught that the teaching, preaching of the word, the performance of preaching, teaching the word is going to change our life, and that's not true. That is a skewed, uh, sidelined understanding. It's out of kilter. It's out of balance. It's that uh, artifact in the tabernacle that represents prayer that was central. Your leader is called to pray for you, and his prayers for you will do far more, will do for you and far more for you than his preaching or his teaching or laying hands upon you or or any other thing will do. Just as our relationship with the Father. How can I be in fellowship with somebody in relationship if I'm not talking to them? Yes, and, and it's a <laughs> and remember that the prayer life is about your your greatest investment, the greatest investment in your life is uh, the relationship your pastor, your church leader has with the Father. His, in other words, he's spending more time with God than he is reaching out to the poor in our community. You know, well, that would get most pastors criticized. Uh, but you see the priority that God that God establishes, folks. We need to change our thinking about what is central. To the, not just for our leaders. We can, we can see a, things that are true about leadership, but in our own lives. Yes, as individuals. Before we reach out, we need to reach up. You cannot allow yourself to become, you cannot allow the urgent to veto the important. Mm-hmm. The demands of life around you to draw you away uh, from your focus upon God. You cannot become so horizontally focused upon others that you lose your vertical commitment to God. Simply put, you must seek the face of God before you seek the face of man because the company of men is a contaminant and God is a jealous God. If you give more of yourself to others than you give to God, God will breathe on those relationships and you'll wonder what went wrong. I think a lot of churches have fallen apart, Mm -hmm. a lot of relationships. There have been men that I have been dear and close friends to me, but because we were more connected to one another in fellowship than we were to God in relationship, God breathed on that relationship and it fell apart Mm -hmm. in strife. And in ungodliness, and we all oh, the devil did that. No, 
We did that by our own lack of piety and our own lack of God is a jealous God. Mm -hmm. And what you allow to come between you and your time with God, God will remove. Jesus. And so why is it you see people get torqued down in the midst of all this pressure? I made a remark the other day, you know, uh, when pastors come to us, they're usually desperate. <laughs> and uh, people come to us, they don't, they don't come to us whenever they, you know, everything's coming up roses and everything they touch turns to gold. Those are not the people that come to us for, for ministries. It's people that are desperate. I believe many times we walk ourselves into the uh, coordinates of desperation in life that it, we need to come back. And again, the prophetic is not about connecting you to a prophet. Mm -hmm. If the prophet connects you to himself, he he is doing you a great disservice. No, he needs you to bring you back to that centrality of your t intimacy with Jesus. And sometimes that's a frustration because you want the prophet to give you an answer and he gives you an assignment. Mm -hmm. And the assignment mm -hmm. is not about solving your problem. It's about getting closer to God. Closer to God. I don't have time to get closer to God. I need to pay the rent. <laughs> My marriage is falling apart. I don't have to. I can get close to God later. No, no, no. This is this solves the problem. Please hear me. <laughs> so, like the ark and the brazen altar, the altar of incense. Notice that it also had a crown. Isn't that interesting? The brazen altar had a crown. The ark of the covenant has a crown. This speaks to us of the kingdom of God and the authority of the believer. Uh, uh, woven into all three compartments and, and artifacts in all three compartments of the tabernacle. It's a continual reminder that you're not only a priest, but you're a king. And it just amazes me how much kickback we have over that. God says you're a principality and a power. He puts you in your life like he put Adam and Eve in the garden. And we continually get kickback on that. Uh, and people have a hard time believing that, looking at it through the lens of traditional Christianity. Even though that there's four, four, five, and many more verses throughout the Old, New Testament that talk about reigning with Christ. Uh, he reigns in us. We reign through him. We are kings and priests unto God. Well, that's it, not just poetry. That's an actual ministry that God's called us uh, to. And, and then we see that the altar of incense was designed with rings and staves. So it was designed to be mobile. Uh, Kitty says, blessed are the flexible. They don't get bent out of shape. They don't get bent out of shape. Christians are some of the most inflexible people. You know, the Catholic Church has, for years, has been called the unchanging church. And I thought, that somehow that doesn't, it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to me. See, because the God who said he never changes, he requires us to be willing to live our lives in a constant state of change. Change isn't change till it's change. God says, you give me some change, and I'll give you some change. The Lord told Kitty one time, give me some cooperation, I'll give you some change. Amen, if, and I did. <laughs> if your life does not look like you would like it to look, if you're living with the, the uh, um, a gap between God's promise and your experience, you better know that uh, the answer is going to involve you changing something about your life, your approach to God, something about you. See, and people run to God, what, oh, this situation, what am I going to do? What is God going to do about this? They want to know, please tell me what God's going to do about this. And, and here's. When. And here and when and he and here's here's the answer. He's going to give you an assignment, and you take it and you put it down, saying, "Okay, I'll get to that in a minute." But when's God going to do something about this? And He gives you an assignment, and you put it down because every blessing of God comes. God's a, a good gift giver. He always wraps His gifts, and He all the gifts of God and the blessings of God and your answered prayer come in the form of responsibilities and assignments because the kingdom of God, Luke seventeen twenty twenty one. It says, doesn't come with observation. Only, so God gives you something to participate in. What's the opposite of observation? Participation. 
Every answered prayer has a response from God by giving you something to participate in because that's what the kingdom is. And if you will do it, Kitty calls that, go ahead and seek the kingdom. Yes, your marriage is falling apart. Go ahead and seek the kingdom. Yes, you have physical issues in your body. You have financial issues. You have church issues. That's, that's right. You got all those. Go ahead and seek the kingdom because going ahead to seek the kingdom is unwrapping the gift which, of the answer of God that's been there all Amen. along. Amen. You have to be willing to do something. That's why it says seek first, because first means first, always first. And and people that go to the prophet, and they don't want to hear what they're supposed to do, they just want to hear what God's going to do, that's treating the prophet like a psychic or a clairvoyant. Mm-hmm. And I, for one, will never do that. That's right. I'm going to get, tell you what God says about your life, and it's almost always going to require something of you. We want to know what God's going to do. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an opportunity to be a participator in my kingdom so that you could be a first partaker of my purposes. That's verses 1 through 6. Actually, we only, I only read through 5. Oh. So should we talk about 6? No. Okay. We'll come back to it and recap it tomorrow. tomorrow. And we'll be back on tomorrow, Tuesday morning and continue in Exodus chapter 30. God bless you. It's an honor and a privilege to wash your feet in the, the, this prophetic perspective of the Word of God. So we thank you, Father, for truth. We thank you for revelation. Thank you for that little pop-up that you, you showed us just now. Um, we just appreciate that you're always new and you're always fresh and you're very exciting. And we see it and we want you and and where are you? We want we want you bigger and bolder in our life every day, no matter what it takes. Stretch us, God, and make us more like you is our prayer. And bless our, our listeners, Father, around the globe and protect them at all times is our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.